Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for this discussion on the visitor economy, the recovery so far. My goodness, what a year it has been, or we should say over a year now. We face the fact of closure last May and we're now all reopened and it's June. So um, I think for some of us, it's been a, a reopening uh, as early as April, um, but for many, it was the 17th of May and the build up to that. So um, thank you for joining us. And we're going to be talking about the recovery. So um, I'm going to start by introducing uh, our panel. I'm Steve Gardner-Collins. I'm uh, sales director, I've got where I work, uh, of the Hatton Collection, a group of hotels across Gloucestershire, Somerset and Jersey. And I'm also a director and chair of Visit Gloucestershire. Uh, I'm going to just hand over to Claire, who's going to introduce herself. Thanks, Steve. And I'm really honoured to be with such eminent people. What a panel. Um, my name's Claire Thayers and I work for a company called Happily, which is passionate about provenance and the journey of our food and informing people to tell them the journey of their food to make an informed choice. Um, but I wear lots of other hats. I'm on Cheltenham Chamber of Commerce board representing hospitality and uh, lots of other boards and what have you. But uh, yeah, I'm sort of seeing this from lots of different angles today. So interesting conversation. Great, thanks Claire, thanks for joining us. Adam, could you introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi everyone, um, my name is Adam Jones. I'm marketing manager of Aerospace Bristol, um, which is a museum in South Gloucestershire. Um, I'm also uh, the representative for tourism on the Chartered Institute of Marketing Southwest Regional Board. Great, thanks Adam, thanks for joining us. Jenny, could you introduce yourself? My name is Jenny Lowe and I am the Visitor Business Manager at Barclay Castle in Gloucestershire. Great, thanks Jenny. Thanks, thanks for joining us. Sammy, could you introduce yourself? Hi everyone, I'm Sammy Luxer. I'm the Marketing Manager at WWT Slimbridge Wetland Centre. Great, thanks Sammy and thanks for joining us. Sam, you're on screen. Could you introduce yourself? Uh, hello everybody, I'm, I'm Sam Holliday. I'm the Development Manager for the Federation of Small Businesses and I cover Gloucestershire and the rest of the world. Thank you. Great, thanks Sam, thanks for joining us. So everybody, we're here to talk about visitor economy. It's been a roller coaster of, uh, I'll say 15 months now, I guess. Uh, we're talking about recovery so far. Um, I guess the big, big kind of question at the beginning of this is, have we weathered the tough times or are we still in the middle of the storm? Thoughts um, on where we're at currently. So Adam, if I start with you, you and I caught up uh, only a matter of weeks ago, actually, uh, in, in one of these sessions to talk about reopening uh, as an indoor attraction, you've reopened, um, weathering tough times or are we still in tough times? What's your perspective? Um, yeah, so as you say, we reopened on the 19th of May for us. We're open five days a week, Wednesday to Sunday. Um, and I would say so far, obviously, it's only been a few weeks, um, though that did include the half term. Um, we are comparing to 2019, which is all we really have to go on because obviously we were closed for much of 2020. Um, we're seeing this numbers kind of around 50% of where they were then. Um, that is um, in line with our own expectations. So versus our targets for May, um, we were a little bit up, though obviously it was only a, a short period of time. Um, and for June, we look like we're going to be kind of there or thereabouts. So it is kind of, you know, fairly significantly down to where we would be in normal times. Um, but I'd say the, the return has been kind of as we as we forecast, as we expected so far, um, which as an indoor attraction, particularly as the half term weather um, was generally very good. Um, we're actually quite pleased with um, because obviously, um, you know, outdoor attractions and people just generally meeting family and friends in gardens and outdoors would probably be the, the priority for a lot of people at the moment. So, um, yeah, still still some way to go, but um, positive signs so far, I think it's fair to say. Weathering the times still, I guess. Jenny, you're not too far away from Adam. How has it been at Barclay Castle? Are you weathering the storm or is, are we seeing the other side of it yet? I would say we're really similar to what Adam just said. Um, we are we open on the 17th of May. We are predominantly an indoor attraction because the castle is obviously all indoors. We do have gardens, um, which helps. Um, but I would say for May, we were at 50% of 2019 numbers. Um, and it helped obviously having two days of half term in May, which were our biggest days so far. 
Um, but it is also what we predicted we would be at, and that's sort of what we're looking at for the rest of the season, looking at 50% of 2019 numbers. So if we can hit those targets, we'll be pleased. I think our biggest impact that is still ongoing is group visits, um, just not having any. Um, so we would normally have between three and six groups a day when we're open at this time of year, and at the moment we're having the odd one here or there, but nothing on the scale that we used to have, and that I think is having the biggest impact on our numbers and isn't particularly changing, so we're not really getting many group bookings still. So when that will change, I'm not entirely sure. So weathering the storm, but still sort of in it, I would feel. <laughs> Could there be a theme? Sammy, you're just down the road again. What, what are you seeing with your visitor numbers? We are. We're actually, obviously, we're predominantly outdoors, though. So we've actually seen a, a massive shift, really, because we have been really busy. Actually, almost last week, it was we were at capacity. So we hit 100% every single day. But I think we opened um, in that second week of the Easter holidays. So we had those sort of, you know, friends and families gathering outdoors. Um, and I think that's been the kind of safety aspect that visitors have really sort of relied upon a lot of our indoor space is actually still closed so our soft play um, is still closed and um, some of we've got our total exhibit but that's a walkthrough so we've only just opened that in on the 17th of May I think that was so we have still got quite a lot of our indoor space closed but the weather obviously has been fortunate last week especially but we're actually I think generally the safer space has been um, being outdoors but we, are, we have got cap numbers still we had increased those last week um, because we were getting our memberships dropping off um, so in terms of our members are booking to visit but they're not necessarily showing up they're, they're sort of booking every single day to visit <laughs> and then choosing when they are so we had about 200 people uh, drop off a day so we increased our capacity based on that and that's what happened last week but yeah last week was actually it was a bit mad at times it felt extremely busy and I haven't seen that sort of number of people together for a very long time so it was a bit of a shock um, and just again us just coping with that with catering and, and, and the knock-on effect of that but like Jenny said the group bookings um, are, aren't coming back yet we haven't started pushing them at all um, but uh, we didn't push school visits and school visits are are really coming in now which was surprising to everybody so we weren't expecting the schools to come back but they are coming back sort of thick and fast at the moment so yeah that's a slightly different but I'm pretty sure it's the outdoor safety um, perception that's doing that. Yeah it's interesting isn't it because we've we've slightly moved on I guess in terms of visitor economy hospitality where it was okay to, to, to dine indoors, to go indoors. So that, that shift, it's interesting, the stats from Adam and Jenny and then yourself as an outdoor attraction. And then I think about when we first opened on the 17th of May and going from no guests to being so busy on lunch and dinner or so soon that there must be a very different perspective on people's expectations. Because in one sense, you've got busy restaurants, busy pubs, people are indoors dining. And then when it comes to actually maybe going out on a day trip for a, to an attraction, people are choosing the outdoor experience, which is why we're seeing a, a slight anomaly on the stats. Lindsay, you've joined us right at the perfect time actually because I was thinking of you when uh, we were just talking about indoor outdoor and then obviously from a catering perspective I've just mentioned kind of how busy we've been we're back to restaurants being open we're talking about weathering the storm if we weathered it are we in right in the thick of it still uh, your perspective do you want to introduce yourself and then perhaps just give us a slight update on whether you think we're weathering it we're in the thick of it where are we at in terms of being open again Yes, apologies for being late. I was on the phone to a guest and they were determined <laughs> to keep going. <laughs> no worries. Don't worry. um, <laughs> um, so I own Cleve Hill Hotel, um, which is obviously um, in one of the sunniest spots today, um, but it's on the Cotswold Way. So from that point of view, I'm seeing a massive trend now for actually the UK guests walking the Cotswold Way this year. Last year it just absolutely dropped off without the European North American, the, the, nobody was walking. Um, but there seems to have been a slight change of heart. I think what you've just been saying about choosing the outdoor activities is absolutely right. Um, and when guests are asking me um, for advice on where to eat or what to do, it's what can they do outdoors? Where, who's got a good pub garden? Who's got, you know, can we get a picnic? What can we do? So definitely being outside seems to be where people are. Um, in terms of how recovery is going, um, 
I'm a little hesitant at the moment. Um, a lot of business is, is still last minute, um, but it's not, um, there seems to be an equal level of cancellations going on. Half term was a complete surprise. I was prepared for a little bit of cancellation, rebooking, et cetera, et cetera. But what went were the long bookings. So I, I kept my sort of one, two night reservations, but the longer three, four nights all dropped out and they then didn't get replaced because obviously they were booked in advance and the shorter trips were what replaced. So instead of it being sort of quite a nice family feel across the holiday, it ended up being lots of ins and outs and ins and outs. So it was, yeah, half term for me was pretty exhausting, to be honest, from that point of view. So I at the minute I'm assuming it will continue to be the same for the summer holidays I'm assuming it will be the same into July my July at the moment is looking heaving um lots of groups wanting to catch up loads of sort of girls boys you know older older girls and boys should we say um wanting to do stuff before summer holidays so before the children break up but again wait and see what happens very sadly because i have an older clientele every now and then i get somebody that's passed away or has had to have a hip replacement or something so, <laughs> so. I think just the whole week if they're booked in for three or four nights i guess that creates a, a definite a definite problem i actually was going to ask you about length of stay and you, you obviously said that you'd hoped certainly through half term that you'd see slightly longer i know that across our group we we're we're kind of seeing a lot of short breaks they're going to devon and cornwall they're either en route there or en route back and, and it's yes. how it weighs up with people going to the attractions because if people are only yes. here as a stopover they're not going to go off and do a day trip here they're going to they're on route to their holiday or back aren't they yeah i have yes i have been very much the stop overnight so i get them turning up exhausted grumpy and fed up of being stuck in the motorway i feed you know look after them overnight and then they disappear off to enjoy the holiday somewhere else and just like doesn't feel very fair um, no, but, there is a um, theme. yeah <laughs> But I think what's really interesting is that a number of people then sort of go, oh, I didn't realise there was so much to do in the area. We should definitely do this next year. And you're like, oh, do it this year, do it this year. Um, so I think it's good advertising from that point of view. But one thing I am noticing is that those that have stayed a few days and are obviously going out and doing lots of different bits and pieces, they're saying that the real honeypots, sort of as we said before, there's real honeypots of Borton and Stowe and all are just crammed full of people from local cities coming out to the country for the day and then going home again and that it they feel really uncomfortable because they don't you know they're away they want space they don't want to be stuck in the honey pot so actually it's been really lovely being able to give them ideas away from the madding crowd things to do in slightly quieter areas which is still cute um but trying to explain that Bybury isn't the only place in the Cotswolds that they need to get to uh, what's your take on then the news this week? Uh, I, I did read a response from you and I uh, about uh, table bookings because Sammy mentioned cancellations, people booking and they're not showing or picking lots of days and only turning up for one. We know that in the restaurants, um, not necessarily in Gloucestershire, but further away, and I've got experience of this out in Jersey for multiple years, not just this year, where people pre-book all their tables and then it's, can they can they get what they actually want when they get here? Um, like safeguarding. Uh, any updates? Because that was Monday. Any thoughts um, on kind of cancellations? Because that's also going to impact us. Yes, I think from a from restaurants, bar scene. In actual fact, I was talking to um, a Greatest Hits Radio this morning about it because it it seems really strange. Like the BBC did an article on it, and all of a sudden, everybody seems to have woken up to it. Whereas <laughs> they given them all the idea. Great. I know. It's like I don't really understand because we struggled immensely last year. I mean, those parts. So Turf Cheltenham is a um, group of independent owner-operated hospitality units. And we had massive issues last year. It was chronic. So this year we wised up to it. We did a little bit of a social campaign. A lot of the restaurants now are taking deposits, non-refundable deposits. Um, you know, they're, they're calling people in the mornings to check whether they're still coming. Um, so we're, we're trying to combat it and being quite proactive, which unfortunately I think is upsetting a lot of the news people because they can't talk about the disaster that it is um but um what it what is occurring though is that the the safeguarding is definitely happening we're seeing outside and inside tables and then whichever way the weather goes you end up with no shows and unfortunately then that's when the problems come because if you get the cancellations in the morning you're then putting people into those spaces if you haven't got time then to follow your protocols they're then not showing 
So in actual fact, we are seeing it. Um, and in one of the fine dining restaurants had a real, real pickle last Friday night. They had an absolute mess. The, you know, they had four cancellations, no problems, rebooked, and then they all no-showed. So they were, they were really upset. And because they're doing reduced hours because of the staffing problems, you know, it's, it's even more tragic, really. Gosh, uh, Claire, you've been in destination for a long time. Uh, you've, you've worked down in Cornwall, again, a seasonal coastal destination. I know that you're having properties out in Jersey, coastal, these sorts of behaviours and habits are definitely um, an issue. And I guess we're now experiencing it. Maybe it's something new here. Hopefully I've got next to us about emerging trends and I'm now question marking that as a, uh, an unfortunate uh, an emergence of maybe something for the future. What's your take uh, having experienced other areas? Had you seen similar patterns elsewhere before? Or have you got yeah. any ideas and options for tackling it? Well, pre-COVID, and let's face it, after COVID now, so many more people are going to be holidaying in this country, and that's a great thing for the UK, so that's a great opportunity for us, and hopefully that will help some people with the recovery. But uh, several years ago, I was on the South West Regional Growth Fund, which was about promoting the region across into Europe. So I was very lucky I went to a lot of the European trade shows, um, Utrecht, Berlin, wherever. Um, and it was really interesting when you're talking face to face with these people who, number one, don't know where Gloucestershire, let alone South Gloucestershire, let alone the Southwest is, is interesting. Um, and also when you start listening to them and their uh, thought behaviours about where they're going to stay, interestingly, a lot of them were saying, oh, we watch Location Location on the TV and a lot of this sort of afternoon TV stuff that goes on they're absolutely clued into that and so they've heard about words like the Cotswolds and, so, and what have you so it's list, it's really interesting listening to them and what makes them decide where to go and it's also very interesting and that's why I'm thrilled Steve that you've taken the bull by the horns and are now leading with Visit Gloucestershire because when you're talking to um, especially the Dutch it's so interesting the different nationalities but the Dutch a lot of it's the grey pound, they've got a camper van, they're going to come over and they're going to drive all along the south coast, probably down to the Isles of Scilly, back up on the Atlantic Highway and then stop off at Bath and Bristol. And for me, it was a really easy sell. And I'm going to say it because I'm a Cheltenham girl, but I'd say, you know, base yourself in Cheltenham for three or four days. Lindsay's smiling because it's probably not saying what I should be saying, but I was really pushing for them to stay sort of central and to say that they can use that as a base and, and go to wherever because they're right on the A40 to take them back to London and back home. So I think what I did learn working with the DMOs, there are 11 DMOs in that South West Regional Growth Fund, and it was really, really hard to get them to work together collaboratively. And even to the point where Cornwall was saying to Devon, we don't care about what's happening in Devon because people just drive through Devon to get to Cornwall. And they're really greedy because they just want everybody for them rather thinking. And that's what I admire. And I cite what Bath and Bristol do all the time. Bath and Bristol complement each other and position themselves differently as brands. So they're not competing and that's certainly something that i've perceived since moving back up here is that resistance between Cheltenham and gloucester working together for example so that why that's why steve i've been behind you 100 what you're doing with visit gloucestershire we need to work to, together collaboratively and actually having itineraries to push people around there's plenty of business for us all um and, you know, sometimes we also have to be absolutely face up to the truth. I know talking to Chipping Camden Business Group, they were really frustrated because they're getting coaches come into Chipping Camden and they're all rubbing their hands thinking, great, they're going to spend some money in Chipping Camden. No, they don't. The Chinese will jump off the, off the bus, all have their selfies in front of the first thatch cottage they can see, back on the bus, and then they go off to Bista, which is the number one holiday um, tourist destination now is Bista um, Outlet Centre because they want to go and spend money on all the Chinese stuff that we've imported and now selling in England is just bonkers but I think we've got so much opportunity for South Gloucestershire and Gloucestershire to make ourselves a destination in our own right and not just a stopover because we've got so much to see. I think definitely um, developing that destination so that we become somewhere people come on holiday would help us all. We would have more people here for longer, hopefully spending more and, and planning itineraries so they are booking tickets and there. Like when we go on when we go abroad and plan a holiday, we know what we're doing on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. If if Lindsay and I in accommodation have got people going in and out, in and out, in and out, they're not staying in the area. And that's what we need to promote though. But that is a hurdle for us all to kind of work together on. Sam, you're in the room. Um your hospitality uh, businesses that you work with, have you had any feedback um, 
maybe it's the same as what we're discussing, but from the FSB perspective. Yeah, there's so much to unpick. It's absolutely fascinating debate. Uh, and Claire's point about Bath and Bristol is interesting because they've now created a new DMO called Visit West, which is slightly confusing for the rest of the South West, I think. But they're keeping Bath and Bristol very much with their own identities, but they've got this thing, entity called Visit West, because they think that'll be hard, easier to market. Um, uh, but when they're going to be up in their game, then clearly we've got to up our game up here in Gloucester as well. Um, but the, um, the it's very interesting to listen to Adam and Jenny and, and Sammy and, and Lindsay that um, it, it kind of mirrors what we're hearing about a lot of things to do with the recovery. It's a very mixed picture. Just as COVID affected everyone differently, I think the recovery is affecting everyone differently. And I can kind of understand why Sammy's doing well and Jenny and Adam have, because we've all been, it's probably always the case that you gravitate towards outdoor venues more in the summer, but we've never had a summer that followed a year when we couldn't leave the house. Um, I, there was a, an opinion poll, I think, in the Times last year, about September time, when the weather was like it was today, it was good weather, it felt good, and 50% of those who'd been forced to work home said they wanted to continue to work from home after COVID. They did that same opinion poll in February and it dropped to 25 because people didn't want, they realised they couldn't go out and there's been this desperate need to sort of get out and do something. And so maybe outdoor venues are benefiting from it now. But it is a mixed picture. I mean, Lindsay pointed out about um, hospitality staffing and things and it's, it's the one thing I'm hearing more than anything. And I was on a regional group um, with the FSB meeting last week, right down to, to, to sort of Cornwall and stuff. Um, and, and Claire will know when, it, it, when the whole government practically is telling you, don't go to Spain, go to Cornwall, people start to believe them. But not only have we got the, like the problem, you, you have of too many people going there, but there's, no, there's very few people to serve them. And actually Cornwall's got an, an extra level of problems which they're picking up on in that they used to have um, places, uh, hotels, rooms or whatever, where, where visiting workers could live during the season. They've all been turned into Airbnbs because people see the potential for pound notes. Um, so I do think it's very frustrating. And, and I'm glad Lindsay said what she said about, about restaurants and deposits, because it drives me mad. I went to a restaurant in, in Gloucester a, a couple of weeks ago, and we'd booked quite way in advance. And, and I was sitting there, and it was half the tables weren't there. And the waitress told me, they're all booked. It's people just not turning up. And she said, it's hard enough to, to make any money at the moment. Imagine only being able to make 50% of what you're supposed to be making. So a I new would... pandemic, cancellations. Indeed, no show. cancellations. But what, why don't we take deposits? We wouldn't go on a holiday without having to pay a deposit. Why, why don't we? And then if you can't go for whatever reason or legitimate reasons, um, then that's fair enough. But I think what does happen is it almost becomes like bed blocking. So I would ring Lindsay's hotel. Then I think, well, I might fancy one in Bristol and you, and you book six and because you would say booking.com there I mentioned them you can cancel the day before so you cancel the day before you just let five down and, and let one got to be a non-refundable deposit so um in summary just sort of what you're saying I think is is a perfect illustration of what's happening generally it's a mixed picture it's like the footfall in, in town centres Cheltenham and, and Bath I heard last week are doing pretty well Bristol city centres down 50% you know, there's no one entity that's the same. So uh, a really mixed picture. But of all the people I'd rather be at the moment in terms of a business, it's Sammy's. We want to be out there. <laughs> out all. Probably what uh, get in. Yeah. Leads in nicely, actually, to my to the kind of next point. Obviously, we're working to these traffic light systems. Portugal's back into amber. Uh, will the domestic staycation continue to help us going forward? I wanted to just get a bit of a perspective on the summer ahead. We've talked about weathering and where we're at right now. Jenny, What's your kind of outlook through the summer months, perhaps even thinking September, October? Have you got a, a bit of a short, medium term plan around tickets and sales uh, that lead you up to? Are you doing like a closure October to March again or am I slightly out there? But you've got kind of got this window now, haven't you, of opportunity. Domestic staycation, do you think that's going to be of any help between now and then? I sincerely hope so. Yes. I mean, we're obviously limiting our numbers at the moment um, and to get to those capacities would be brilliant right now, actually. Um, but it would be helpful in the summer if we don't have to have limits on numbers and just really, really go for it in terms of our summer holidays, especially for schools, school summer holidays. Um, we have got events planned, so we, we've booked things, um, which I think is unusual to some other businesses at the moment, but we've gone ahead. We've got our joust weekend in. I just think we thought we needed to plan as though it's going to be a normal summer just to give us the best possible chance of that. Um, whether we're going to get there... I don't know. Um, 
Our targets, like Adam, are 50% of 2019 numbers, which is a pretty sorry state, really. But if we can hit that, I'll be very happy indeed. Um, but I don't know. I, I feel like I, I really in the dark about what's going to happen. Um, ticket sales are ticking along quite nicely. Um, but at the moment, I have no clear picture of what the summer is going to be like for us. Adam, similar situation as Jenny in the numbers. I'll come to Sammy next. But your perspective over the summer, I guess you're waiting for June the 21st in an ideal way for restrictions to be dropped and, and a semi-normality throughout the summer to help you. Yeah, so um, we have, obviously, we, nobody knows, but um, we've been fairly optimistic in the forecasted numbers. So while we're on target now with about 50%, um, we actually have that forecast to ramp up quite quickly. Um, and so by the summer, um, we're, we're forecasting, uh, hoping to be at kind of 80 or 90%, um, which obviously it remains to be seen whether that's achievable. Um, we did get close to that and certainly um, some days and weeks um, in the summer last year, because we were open August, September, October. So we actually, for that summer holiday period, have a little bit more to go on because we can look back at 2020 rather than having to look all the way back to 2019. And obviously the situation was much more similar back then with potentially restrictions still in place this year, we'll, we'll wait and see. Um, so yeah, we're, it's highly weather dependent, obviously. Um, again, going back to what we were saying before, a rainy summer, we, summer will be quite, have, have quite a good chance of being up at those numbers. So if it's a, you know, brilliant, sunny, um, school holiday over the summer, then, then maybe not, but, um, that's, that's what we're targeting. Um, and yeah, I think in terms of this staycation, um, we're quite fortunate in that we're just off the M5. Um, so we're a bit like some of the, the accommodation and the venues are saying about stop off points. Obviously we're, we're quite happy to be a stop off point. If people are traveling down to, um, the Southwest along the M5, um, we're, we're well situated for that. So that's something that we, um, I wouldn't say we have necessarily identified a huge benefit from that right now it's probably a little too early to say um but as the kind of summer holiday season develops that's something that we'll be we'll be looking out for and that will hopefully help us achieve those fairly optimistic numbers great thanks adam sammy you've got you're in a hey-ho i say hey-ho gosh i uh, let's hope it's sustainable uh, that point kind of around the travel light system domestic market um uh, that kind of situation at the minute that we've got where people can't go abroad that's clearly going to benefit you for outdoors what's your kind of planning at the minute around it's great right now summer holidays yes we know naturally as the seasons change sometimes outdoor becomes not what we all need to be doing because it's piddling it down with rain outside what, what's your kind of have you got anything more medium planning wise to cope with that through the the change in the season later on in the in the summer Yes, because we're an all year round attraction besides Christmas Day is the only day we close all year round. So we have had that wet weather that we had a few weeks prior to this lovely sunny time um, and it was lower visitor numbers. I think the big difference for us in the last year is that we've made all bookings available online. So people have to pre-book before they visit and that has kind of guaranteed a bit more of a steady um, level of emissions because they've had to pre-book so we have a mixture of members and paying visitors we've been paying um, on the day and because they had to pre-book online they they can't really cancel based on weather so that has actually been quite a good benefit for us since the last year since the COVID regulations came through and I think from look at where the restrictions may or may not lift I think we're going to probably keep that pre-booking element there um, because it does also with a capacity limit help spread out the numbers on the days so we're not just having these massive peaks and troughs um, as, as like half term whether it's all peak over that sort of six week summer period we hope it will be a bit more steady out there um, we are actually going we've actually got really high visitation targets this summer um, we were meant to finish a National Lottery Heritage funded project um, called Slimish 2020 last year. So we have to deliver our new exhibits by the end of the summer. So we've actually we've actually decided to go ahead with our, our campaign for the summer, uh, which also goes into autumn, called My Slimbridge. And it's a core campaign offer explaining what Slimbridge is 
is as an attraction now and what maybe not what you've previously done. So the first burst is summer and it focuses on the family market for the summer holidays. And then the second burst is for aimed at our nature lover core adult audience and focuses on more midweek visitation for autumn. So and it's also showing the different aspects of Slimbridge to visitors. There's something there for everybody. But, you know, we are a wetland centre. We do expect to, <laughs> it to be wet sometimes. And actually winter here is some of our busiest um, days because we've got a lot of um, migratory birds here and all our nature lovers and bird watchers come down to Slimbridge specifically in winter. So but it's just trying to keep that those peaks and, and troughs. And in terms of staycation, I think we're a good meeting point for sort of families meeting halfway up the motorway, which has been great. But also we have tried to expand our offer a little bit further. So we've got our Buick's Lodge accommodation, which is one lodge that we we rent out. And we've actually had we've actually booked out um, until September, I think a couple of weeks ago. And now we're getting inquiries for January. So that was actually been really surprising and great. But our bookings, the staycation are coming in. And I think maybe due due to the last announcements where the, the sort of traffic light systems changed quite a lot, people are doubting maybe if they can go abroad this year. So we're definitely seeing an uplift in that sort of staycation market, I think. Great. Lindsay, accommodation, you've been in the same same kind of pinch, staycation, Portugal back on the amber. Not to over, um, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, think, I think, to be perfectly honest, people are hedging their bets. Um, I was reading an article the other day that said a lot of people have booked time off of work but haven't actually booked anywhere to go because I think they're still hoping. Even... The one thing, and interestingly, I think it's coming through in, in all angles as we've been talking about it. Amazingly, even though we've been locked down, I feel like people this time around aren't maybe as um, excited or as pleased to have things back. It's almost like the grumpiness is still there. It, even with things like the no-shows, it's like you missed hospitality. You were groaning you couldn't go to the pub, but now there's, there's that level of respect where you're like, well, I can't even be bothered to cancel the table. And I'm kind of seeing that with reservations as well. People are getting a little bit grumpy if they can't get what they want, when they want it, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't know if it's frustration because, you know, they're, they're having to holiday in the UK when maybe they don't particularly want to. I don't know. So I'm, I personally speaking, I'm, I'm as busy as I can be, but because of the way the regulations are, I can't run the hotel to maximum capacity at the moment. Um, and as an operator, I have no idea exactly what will happen um, at the end of this month. And in as much as even if they relax the regulations, I don't know what that means for hospitality. Nobody's actually come out from like UK hospitality and said, oh, well, that means you can, I don't know, stop triple cleaning this or you can have a buffet back or, you know, we don't exactly know what that's going to mean operationally. So I'm still having to be slightly hesitant in what I'm doing in terms of reservations because I still need... I'm presuming I will still have a level of regulation for the rest of the year. And so I'm, I'm trying to hedge my bet. So it's, it's making it a very interesting uh, situation to overbook, not overbook. Do I, you know, which, which way mm. do I go with it? So yes, it's, it's definitely going to be um, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm loving all the buzzwords today. Interesting. I wasn't expecting that. Um, <laughs> so yeah, my, my attention's slightly turning because We've mentioned, or a couple of us have mentioned, staffing issues, and I know that's a big thing within. Uh, Sam, you just mentioned it, staffing, uh, and I'm in a, I'm in a limbo. I was asked a question this morning around what's causing it. You know, chef shortage, um, being able to recruit people into the sector. Is it COVID related? Was it there before? Were we just kind of not not seeing it? Um, and I think that it's a, it's going to become a big issue, particularly when you're providing service. If you haven't got somebody at the other end, all these ticket sales or all these lovely people coming to stay, there's nobody there to actually deliver the service. And uh, I actually wrote down the word Brexit because I, we, this is an international show. So it's we're, we've, we're focused on our domestic staycation at the minute. But obviously we, we want our groups back and we want our international visitors back. We need them. So as we kind of go into that, that realm now of international, uh, do we think as a sector, is it COVID that's actually caused our skill shortage and crisis? Or is it not kind of Brexit now that we're, you know, we're talking about weathering a storm? Is, have we just kind of missed one and we've dealt with the other? I don't know who wants to go first. Cause normally I go around in circles. Claire, what's your perspective on COVID for visitor economy meets Brexit with a skill shortage? Maybe. I don't know. 
I think the skill shortage has always been there, Steve. I, th I certainly in Cornwall, they cannot get chefs. Um, as Steve, as Sam was saying, you know, the, the big challenge you've got in Cornwall is on a peninsula. Everybody's buying properties up for holiday lets and Airbnbs, and there just is nowhere to put people up. And it's sad for me. You go into a very nice top end restaurant and you're served not by Cornish people. You hardly ever hear a like, lovely Cornish accent. You're served by people from Eastern Bloc and what have you, because it can't find local people to fill those jobs, which is tragic for me because there's huge amounts of unemployment in Cornwall. But there isn't the aspiration. And, and I think it's sad that service industry and hospitality has got the image that it's got you know if you're in america people are thrilled to be in the service industry you know with all the um they love it there's no it's, there's no nothing bad about being in service industry in america you'd be proud of it but here there is that element to it and funny enough Lindsay and i were talking about it about how we can engage for example within cheltenham how can we start reaching out working with the schools encouraging them to think about hospitality as a career path and that's the thing it, and you said yourself, Steve, you know, you start working on a table, but once you get into that and you're interested in that, then you want to be able to progress and go further. So I think there's huge opportunities for hospitality to start reaching into our communities and home growing our own talent and keeping the talent in our locality. Um, again, I think you touched on it, Sam. So many people are leaving the area and zooming off to London and stuff. But, you know, we can we can offer just as good opportunities here as we can in London. Um, but we have to change people's perception of working in the industry, I think. Yeah, Jenny, are you struggling, uh, Sam, Jenny and um, Adam, are you all struggling for staff within the attractions as well? Jenny, you maybe go first. Um, I know our catering team are really struggling. Um, we're struggling to find a chef and a few front of house staff. They have um, recruited a lot, but some of them just aren't necessarily right for the position. Um, we're also struggling to find cleaning staff. So definitely notice that more this time around. And we weren't recruiting actually last year. So we felt it more this time around than 2019, definitely, yes. Sammy, catering, I guess, feeling the same? Yeah, it's, it's really difficult actually. And that visitor expectation is when those restaurants could reopen that the whole service would be back up to full speed and we weren't able to offer that at all we really struggled to recruit with catering um we've got agency staff in at the moment just to get to tide us through that half term period um but it's been a massive struggle we've had a lot of school sort of just out of school applicants that are, are going for the jobs but obviously they've got no experience so we can't just employ at that level we need much higher up but it's been a massive challenge and i think the some of the catering staff that have left our attraction are actually going are, are retraining in another area so one of them's going into to become a paramedic some another one's going to be a counselor um one's going to work for a funeral director which i really didn't think is that much about <laughs> where we were at I, need a job. Because, need a job. I know i think it's just because they they went through such a hard time and were furloughed for so long and it just wasn't any guarantees of them returning to sort of work that was more more solid so um yeah it's been a massive difficulty strangely enough we put some permanent positions out and didn't have that many applicants but we've put some casuals um positions out and we've had more applicants for them which has been a bit of a surprise actually wasn't really expecting Flexible that working yeah same with uh cleaning as well that's been the same issue that jenny's just raised so yeah it's been it's a, it's a massive a massive shortage adam feeling the same at museum um to be honest i'm i'm not uh, massively aware of um, shortages in the catering side of things, um, but I think that's largely because we work with a large contract caterer, and it's probably just that I'm, you know, not particularly aware of the issues that they're having to deal with on a, a national or or actually international scale for that company. But based on what others are saying, I, I strongly suspect they're having similar problems. Um, in terms of staff in the museum itself, um, we were very pleased to see our volunteers come back. Um, particularly um, as many of them, they quite a lot of retired engineers um, working at or volunteering at the museum. And so there was some concern that they might be quite cautious about coming back or, you know, reluctant, understandably. Um, but they've come back really, really strongly um, and, and kind of raring to go. And I think quite glad to, to get out and meeting people again. So that's been really nice to see. Um, and on the more casual and, and employed um, front of house staff. Um, I think the main concern really has been that if 
um, if we lose staff due to um, you know having to self isolate or you know a couple of people um, catching COVID and therefore having to obviously be off for a period of time and people that they've come into contact with, um, it's it's we've got enough staff to run the museum. It's the concern that 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 if we are able to open, but there is a little you know kind of mini yeah. outbreak essentially then you know will you still have enough staff to run run the museum and, and obviously run it safely um so that's that's a real kind of challenge in the background as well yeah i did i did pass the comment uh, again i said this morning around uh, i work i've worked in hotel 18 years and i over the last decade so many more of my colleagues more a higher percentage of my colleagues have have not been english they've all been from lots of other nice countries you don't go to a french restaurant and expect to be served by an english person and french restaurants are struggling to find french staff and and you know i say it openly we all know when we go to a hotel and you check in at reception it's sometimes you've broken english straight at reception and the housekeeping don't normally speak english and we're used to that now we've become quite um reliant upon it and i think that's what's actually causing our skill shortage uh, now because we've not been promoting to an entire generation that working in hospitality along with care and other other sectors that you can have a career and it's it's fine we need cleaners we need bed changers we need kitchen porters their jobs you can make a career out of it but if you sit at the kitchen table with your kids when was the last conversation you had where you said it's fine you can go and be a cleaner because most parents are like we want you to go and do this we want you to be technology we want you to be cyber we want you to be coders and actually we need a whole generational shift where they go actually we, we need bum wipers in our care homes ultimately because if we don't say to them it's fine then we're not having anyone to do those jobs and we're kind of at that stage now where we're we're struggling for cleaners and catering stuff and i think it's for that very reason anyway um maybe the b word too soon we're still dealing with the c word but um the way forward then for the sector uh we're just going to be uh talking to gloucester rugby actually who have just joined us gareth so we'll introduce gareth in a second um actually i'll introduce gareth and then we'll talk about the way forward because that should uh conclude us quite nicely let gareth come into the room sam you've been dealing with brexit for a while now haven't you because you've You've brought Brexit up a few times in a, in a couple of meetings with me. Yeah, I, I think your question was very interesting. Is it COVID or Brexit? I would argue mm. it's both. Mm. I think it's COVID because the, the anecdotal evidence is there are a lot of people who were chefs, who were waitresses, who were bar staff, um, have, had time, have had time, haven't they? The one gift that COVID give a lot of people is time. And they thought, do I really want to go back to that? Do I really want to go back to those long hours and the pay? And so they haven't come back. Um, and, and, even, and it isn't just at local level. There was a report in the Sunday Times at the weekend that Michael Rood Jr., who, who runs a beautiful restaurant in the middle of London, has had to cancel his lunch times now because he can't get the staff. And I'm thinking, representing small businesses, if he can't get staff, what chance have my little restaurant down the road got? And, and the Brexit effect is obvious because, as Claire was saying, you know, they, if she didn't hear the Cornish accents, well, she probably won't hear the Eastern European ones either now because they've either left because they had to leave because of COVID or they've left and they've simply not come back. So I think you're absolutely right. I think we have got, we've had a generations of not taking these jobs seriously enough and we're now feeling the whirlwind and it's something we're all got to be concerned about because we've got some of the best hospitality in, in, in the world. We've got some of the best leisure attractions in the world. We need staff, otherwise nobody can see any of this. So it's a big issue. <clears throat> Thanks, Sam. Gareth, I'm going to introduce you because we're, uh, we're at the tail end of our session and we want to hear from you. We've been talking, of, do you want to introduce yourself first, John? <laughs> Hi, Steve. Yeah, guys. Sorry, I'm late. I've got the time wrong with this. I thought it was uh, was it was an hour later. Um, but yeah, so I'm I'm Gareth. Um, I started working at, at Gloucester Rugby um, about six weeks ago. Um, before that, I was um, done sort of a few bits over over the last year. But I was working at the Cheltenham Town Hall uh, for the Cheltenham Trust, um, and I was sort of a a victim of that early part of the uh, of the of the, of the COVID outbreak, um, but yeah, it's good to kind of be getting back into to the industry, although it's a, a difficult time. Yeah, we talked about weathering the tough weathering the storm, if you like, right now. And I guess for you uh, as a sports venue, uh, you did do some trials a couple of weeks ago, was it? To, with, yeah, with players so and that. We were lucky to have fans in for the for the London Irish game, um, which was a few weeks ago now. Um, and that went really well, but I mean, weathering the storm probably uh, is quite a good way to put it, really, because obviously, uh, I don't know if anyone else heard, but a week later, we then got a, a COVID outbreak within our, our kind of 
playing staff and, and, and wider sort of team here at King's Home. And we lost um, a game last Friday, which should have been played against Bath, which is kind of our biggest game of the season. Um, we were supposed to have fans in for that um, and, it, and it couldn't go ahead, which is a real tough one to take because, as you can imagine, from an operational and an admin perspective, the, the bulk of the work had been done and there was considerable work to be done for that, really, in terms of track and trace and um, all the information we needed to collate to just get people into the into the venue. Um, we'd kind of done all that and then found out the event couldn't go ahead, um, which was really tough. And I think, you know, I think, you know, when you're talking about kind of some of the issues of staffing in the industry and stuff like that, if you have got people who are kind of planning to work and, and planning to do things and then at the last minute things aren't going ahead, uh, it makes it even more difficult, doesn't it? Definitely. Have you found, because you've taken um, catering internal now, haven't you? So you, you're not outsourcing it anymore. Have you been struggling to find staff? Well, that hasn't uh, been an issue for sure. Yeah, C- catering was still... Um, uh, we still have an external company doing catering for up until kind of the start of June. And then we've pretty much been locked down um, at the stadium since then. So we haven't really been open yet, but we are, you know, we, we've brought on a lot of new, new staff over the course of the, the last few weeks. And it's just um, well, sort of a few months. Uh, and now it's kind of a, a little bit about, you know, how much of the, the old team kind of stay with us and, and, and how many new people we have to bring in. But um, I think we're, we're probably quite lucky with that really. Definitely. Are you? Um, we talked about Brexit briefly on on the staffing side, and uh, and naturally inviting visitors back to the destination. How reliant are you on non locals to come to the games? Uh, I guess the away games. No, not the away. So if you have Bath, you'd have Bath visitors. How reliant are you on the general flow of visitors to come over to the stadium? Yeah. Well, obviously, I've. Cut, I don't know if. Uh... If anyone kind of met me in my previous time, I was, I was at Charlton Racecourse, and that was obviously a huge amount of the staff we've had were coming from, you know, a good couple of hours away um, at times. To be honest, because because I'm fairly new to the team here at King's Home, I'm not really sure on, on how that works, and especially because, you know, previously we've had our our catering kind of, you know, externally looked after. It hasn't really been something we, we've had to deal with too much, but I think that's probably a, a challenge to, uh, you know, a challenge that we're going to have to deal with over the course of the next few months to see kind of how that affects us, really. Okay, well, thanks for joining us today. Um, so in terms of uh, the way forward, because in an ideal world, as, as those that have joined me before on these discussions, the next kind of time we'll talk will probably be uh, in around in the autumn time. Um, we've talked about the summer. If you had any advice for business owners that are currently sat there listening to us talk about current situation, or um, if you had <clears throat> something, an outlook perspective on what businesses could be thinking about for a, for a busy staycation, we hope, fingers crossed. What, what kind of would you, what would be your final thoughts on this is where we're at right now, we're whether in a storm, whether it's staffing, whether it's ticket sales, whether it's cancellations, what one top tip could you give to a visitor economy business owner if they were sitting watching here now? Claire, I'll throw it to you first. I was itching, I was hoping you would. <laughs> well, you're off mute, so I thought you were. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the one thing after COVID is that we are in a position where we can turn this into an opportunity. And I think never before has collaboration, partnership been more important. And a couple of years ago, I was quite shocked when I was talking to Chartman Festivals because they weren't actually talking to the accommodation providers locally. They weren't thinking about doing packages to encourage people to not only come to the festival, but to stay. So I think the more that we can think of about those partnership opportunities that 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 would be my tip to anybody you know if you're a hotel and you're close to one of these wonderful attractions um don't be afraid to to pick up a phone or go and see somebody and say you know how can we work with you so that that would be my tip yeah adam what's your down in south south gloucestershire um obviously as an accommodation provider it's like gone by the fell by the wayside that we're kind of in touch going can we buy tickets for our guests because it's almost become too kind of processes for the visitor hasn't it it's almost time to do it all at home they're booking their accommodation and having to buy tickets online we need to re-establish these connections Uh, are you at that stage where you're engaging yet or i think it's something that perhaps we should take away as a to-do certainly as we go seasonal change to start reintroducing these partnership working again yeah we we've had um they're slowly getting picked back up really the partnerships that we had so we've had some um hotels that we have packages with um it's generally been them rather than the other way around getting to up your bars and say that they're basically 
they're ready to start promoting it again, um, and which has obviously been great to see. Um, we, to be honest, only had a, a few of those quite locally in place um, anyway, but um, we'd obviously like to do more. So yeah, I definitely agree with that collaboration point. Um, in fact, just before the pandemic, we were arranging a partnership with Barclay Castle as well. Um, to what Jenny was saying about getting the groups back, um, we put together a group's itinerary that we were just about to launch um, when the pandemic began. So um, yeah, there's all kinds of opportunities to work together that I think we need to um, pick up again. And um, yeah, and in terms of a tip or advice or what I think, I think again, what Jenny said earlier about kind of planning for the summer or for the season as as if it's going to be, you know, you're going to be able to deliver the things that you want to deliver, I think is really the only way to go. You know, we've got a big event um, planned this quite late in the year in October uh, with the first British astronaut um, doing a talk and Q&A at the museum. That will only really work if we can have hundreds of people in the Concorde hangar under Concorde listening to this talk and joining in. Um, so we've booked it in, it's all planned, it's and there's all kinds of other things like that that we'll schedule throughout the year. And it will be really disappointing if it doesn't happen. And a lot of hard work potentially, you know, gone to waste or have to be postponed. But I think the only option is to to go for it and, and keep your fingers crossed, really, because you, you, that's the only way you'll make the most of the opportunities that, that do arise, really. I guess, Jenny, you're going to echo that go for it momentum that you started at the beginning of the conversation. Stay po try and stay positive. Um, it, I'm sure it will get back to the way it was. Um, it's rough at the moment, but try and plan for normality and hopefully that will make it happen. <laughs> um, and just like Adam said, um, just as I say, try and stay positive. Keep smiling. <laughs> <laughs> Sammy, any top, top tip or you know, something related um, to the summer ahead or beyond? Yeah, definitely. I think we, we haven't started looking at our partnerships yet, but we're I think well we had a meeting with Jenny a couple of weeks ago about our group our joint group visit so we'll start getting that um, ready again and then looking at hotel partnerships I think there was a question about that that came up in the discussion and I think yeah attractions are always I think willing to look at a look at working with hotels and other partners it's just maybe um, the hotels being a bit more you know but both of us trying to be get out there and, and communicate that the other thing I would say with my top tip would be to if you can get them to pre-book to pre-book and to pay a deposit um f try and enforce a bit more of commitment from people we have struggled to do that with our members but we are actually thinking about putting a, mem a message out to our members to say please you know don't take all the slots up if you're not going to visit just commit to that one day um and that's the thing that's really made a difference for us is that pre-booking online for us so i think we'll try and continue that where we can great uh sam I don't know what you're going to pick, but a top tip or some thoughts to go away with? Well, no, I like a lot of what everyone's been saying already, to be honest. I always agree with Claire about collaboration. It's something we've talked about a lot. In fact, Claire, Lindsay and I talked about the same thing only a few weeks ago. Um, but I like what Adam was saying as well about get that thing in the diary now for October the 1st and believe it's going to happen. Um, mm. I think we should keep, we should all look forward now, not look back. And I think we should. Uh, I, I do appreciate what Lindsay said about customers getting a bit grumpy, but we need some commitment from them as well. And I do think that deposit thing, if we, I'll take away from this session that about get people's deposits. If you're in a situation where people, you know, COVID means the game can't go ahead, well, your ticket will have to hold over. But if someone's booking a slot in your restaurant and they're willing to pay £30 for a meal, they're willing to pay £5 for a deposit. So if they decide at the last minute they're not going to come, at least you've got £5 in the bank, if not £30. Um, and I just think that, you know, get the customer to commit and just be positive and keep looking forward. So we're all going to Adams on October the 1st, and there'll be lots of events before then, but um, don't put any doubt in anyone's mind, it, it's gonna happen. Optimism all the way. Lindsay, the era of optimism, what's the summer gonna hold, come on. I think it has, I think it's all about looking forward, about what everybody said, but I think it, the key thing is about thinking outside the box. We've all had to, over the past year and a half, rethink our products in some way, shape or form to keep them going. And just because COVID may be changing, the restrictions are changing, or Brexit, whatever we've discussed, don't, don't go backwards in your minds, go forwards, keep thinking outside the box. What can we do? We can make it phenomenal. We can rebuild whatever we want to rebuild. Nothing's holding us back. If anything, the past year and a half has just proved 
there are no foundations that stick you know the world's your oyster so from that point of view look at what you can do and work out how to make it happen rather than thinking oh i can't do it because of this or because of that or well yes but this happened you know it's all about thinking forwards and all about just seeing what's out there and working out what you want to be moving forwards as your business Thanks, Lindsay. Gareth, what a whirlwind 15 minutes you've had. Um, yeah. uh, difficult for you to probably put a perspective on the summer because your season is fixed, isn't it? But uh, in terms of that outlook for you, I guess get COVID out of the way in terms of that, that local break, outbreak we've had in the last few weeks. Hopefully turn the tide and, and kind of the future ahead looks much more positive. Certainly, yeah, and I think I'd sort of echo what, what Lindsay said a little bit about sort of thinking outside the box and, you know, diversifying the revenue streams we've got here because um, we are sort of launching a, a calendar of events, um, events that we're putting on ourselves that we've not really been able to do too much in the past because, you know, uh, you know, we didn't have the catering in house, so we, you know, it cost us X amount to put to put a meal on for somebody, which is which has been sort of drastically reduced now because we're doing the catering ourselves. So, you know, we've planned a whole calendar of events for the next twelve months, which are going to get people, um, you know, here on a on a kind of Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, uh, which perhaps all would have been taken up by you know perhaps corporate dinners or charity dinners in the past, and we're just trying to be careful that you know if those don't happen over the next year, we've got something to. Uh, to take their place and yeah i think just diversifying that that revenue stream is, is going to be really key right well thank you everybody um stay positive and believe it will happen i think is the general theme for from today coupled with a whole load of other buzzwords that we picked up on uh thank you to my panel for um joining me this afternoon and thank you to everyone that's been watching i hope you've enjoyed the last hour really hope the best for the summer the staycation uh, ahead and we'll see you all in the autumn thank you <laughs>